my task has been made uh, much more easier since last night's, you know, very enlightening uh, keynote speech by Dr. Osama. Um, and um, I have been reflecting a lot about the field work that I'm engaged in. I come to this topic from a very different angle. Yes, academic studies are important. Historical studies are important to understand sectarianism today. But studying the people themselves is far more important. What is happening to them? Because sectarianism has taken a toll on the innocent people. People are being killed simply because they happen to be Shia or Sunni, for that matter. And what we see is, there are two institutions vying with one another in the Middle East, especially in those areas where sectarianism is right. Or I should say, the question of identity is very important for them. It's not that I, in Najaf, would introduce myself as a Shia, but would I go to the shrine or not? Would I pray in the shrine or not? So there are rituals connected with my identity, a sense of identity. Ahovamiya in Baghdad is a very important center. It is center where the Sunni ulama are trained. They come from all over the world, especially from India, South Africa, and Pakistan. So we can see the implications of Ahovamiya in South Asian take on the identity. What exactly is Shia identity doing in India? And I still remember asking my professor, Sayyid al ulama Ali Nakim Nakawi in Aligarh Muslim University, why didn't you migrate to Pakistan? He said, Hum yahan bhi achai. we are better here in India, which is a secular state. In other words, there was already among the ulama, among the religious leaders, a sense of secularism protect, protecting their rights as a minority. Shia are a majority. For a long time, Shia have been majority in Iraq. But their rights were overlooked until the American invasion. That's the time when the Shia attained what we call the empowerment that was awaiting them. Two institutions I mentioned, one is Hosea and Mia. One, year, one is the seminary education and educators in the seminary. And the second is the university. University with thoroughly secular mindset. Even in Kulliyat al Fiqh, where I taught last year in Najaf, even there there is also a recognition that secularism works much better than having religious identity imposing itself. So there is a recognition of the practical dimension of where we need to move in the area of governance. The question arises about what is the Hausa or what is the seminary able to do? University of Kufa president, Dr. Akhil Yassin, told me that he and three others from the University of Kufa, they visited Maraj Taqlid on one particular question. They wanted to invite the Mufti of Al-Azhar to come to Najaf. The Mufti made a condition. I will come if you stop the Sahaba, if you stop condemning the companions of the Prophet. And not only that, all of you, all the Maharaja in Najaf should give a fatwa that this is haram, this is not proper for them to do. In other words, there was a battle that was historical. It, was, it had historical consciousness as part of that collective identity. And that was being fought. And here the Mufti of al Azhar wants to come. And he is making condition. Dr. Akhil and three others in the university are going to each Maharaja in Najaf. All of them are refusing to say anything about that. They say no, because they have their own clients, so to speak. They have their own followers who would not agree with them. So here the leaders are, what Mutahari said about Iran, that Maharaja are controlled by the people by the bazaar, by, this, by the souk, by that money that comes from the bazaar. In other words, there is a sociological dimension to where the power comes to them, 
from where? Is it simply the books that they read, or the books that they write, or what exactly is it? Or is it the homes that is coming to them, the 20% of the nest, you know, net gross savings of the Shia goes to the Maharaja, those who give, and the millions of dollars flowing in Najaf at this time, more than al -Bamir. Now, when you look at this situation, what we find is there are two target communities. I think that I, I am inclined to accept Marshall Watson's use of communalism as a better serving paradigm than sectarianism when it comes to communities who identify themselves simply as a matter of rituals, as a matter of religious praxis, and as a matter of identification with a particular group in the society. There is an enclave of the Shia community in the southern city, for example. And there's an enclave of the Sunni community in certain other areas. So you have enclaves of these communities, and the communities are interacting. Mind you, up to 1978-79, the rise of Iran revolution, there were constant exchanges in Baghdad. You could go to Baghdad Souk, and you could see the Shia and the Sunni together trading. In other words, there was no competition going on which would create the animosity in the people. Yes, there were always questions about the rituals that the Shia practiced and the Sunni did not approve of. Because Salafia was entering as a critic, at the critical moment in the intercommunal relationship. Which was very much, by the way, we have also Salafia Shia brand of it. There are also Shia Moors who are thinking the same way, that let's go back to our sources and, you know, let's see that there should, no, there should be no compromise made with other communities. Now, communalism has created what we call a need to target two particular groups in the society. You'll be surprised. The first one is the youth. The youth who are easily going to be recruited for militancy are going are the new target of the new kind of leadership that should emerge among the youths. So what we have is, first of all, the establishment of UNESCO Chair of Interreligious Studies in the University of Kufa. This is the first of its kind. And there was a debate. Where should this chair be located? In Adab, Kuliyat al-Adab, or Kuliyat al-Fiqh? Kuliyat al-Fiqh, by the way, the government and the Ministry of Higher Education in Baghdad were saying that it should be part of Kuliyat al-Fiqh. There was a problem. There was a problem of diversity and pluralism. Would they submit to that requirement of the modernity? Coexistence is a modern issue. And it has been imposed all across the world. You would never have thought about Baha'is being accepted in Iran quietly. But it is happening, because that's the pressure of modernity. It requires to come to terms with coexistence, even with those who be disagree. And that kind of you know, movement is targeting the youth. Now I'll tell you, Minister of Higher Education is engaged in getting the Sunni universities and the Mostly Shi universities, first of all, exchange the faculty. That means uh, professors teaching in Al Alamiya are also teaching in Kuliyat al in University of Kufa. So that is, that is okay. But there's also a target group, which is what we call the youth leadership. How can the youth be made responsible for two important qualities that are needed? One is to agree to disagree, and the second one is the necessity of civil association. How are we going to increase this among the youth? So the proposal is, by the way, to make cultural adjustments to celebrate cultural pluralism in Iraq. Cultural pluralism. And this is surprising that for the first time, Yazidis are part of the conversation. They are not isolated the way they were before. The Yazidis were not even, you know, monotheists, so to speak. But now they are part of it. And the more the ISIS has, all, you know, rejected the Yazidis, the more Yazidis are now finding home in Najaf. So Najaf has become, all of a sudden, a multicultural and multi-faith society. 
in which we find changes are coming that are actually very, very interesting for us to observe on the ground. And the ground, I'm, I'm, I really mean that because I'm actively engaged in building those bridges. I'm writing the modules, both in Arabic and English, for the youths to prepare the workshop that is going to take place in Kufa, University of Kufa, in the last week of October. That's when we will get the youth leaders to come and to take part in this workshop, which is going to train them in what we call multicultural communication. How do we communicate with each other? I'm Kurdish, I'm Arab, I'm Turkoman, I'm this, I'm that. How exactly are we going to create the civil association that the modernity is demanding from us? So what we have is providing now Religious minorities, the Shia are in the majority now. Religious minorities who should also be empowered by the, by the people themselves. Religious leaders are playing a double game. Outwardly they would say they are supporting it, but they are not actually supporting it. We went to Ayatollah Sistani's representatives, we went to Ayatollah Fayyaz's representatives, all the Maraji, and they are all very hesitant to go through what we call the agreement that all people should be, although publicly Sistan would say, how would I mean unfortunately now? These are, you know, these Sunnis are from ourselves. They are, not, they are not only our brothers, they are us. In other words, he would try to say that, and yet there was discrimination. There was to be, it was to be found because the question is economic privileges that sectarian identity sometimes creates. Now as a minority, as a majority, you have you know, Prime Minister, you have, then you have what we call to add to it, Dr. Akil was telling me that sometimes you get a grant of one million dollar in Baghdad. By the time it filters to University of Kufa, there's only 250,000 left. All other 750 has been corrupted and been taken away by others. In other words, there's so much rampant corruption that uh, at this time, Muqtada Sadr is actually harping on that issue, that the leaders are not saying enough. No, the governance has changed, the democratic, just governance, no, the religious leader, leadership is responding to the needs of the people. In other words, how are we going to change that? Youth is the first target group. The second target group is women. And mostly those mothers, by the way, there is what we call already a paradigm shift. We used to talk only to men when it came to you know, intercommunal inter um, arrangements. But now there are more women participating. There are more women are included. And we have actually, this program has been funded by IREX. This is an international you know, um, group that is funding these kind of, kinds of, you know, um, community development uh, projects. And one of the requirements is that there should be gender equality represented. So University of Kufa has actually committed itself to get more women involved. Partly there's another reason to it. The recruitment of the young people to ISIS, to the Islamic State, sometimes is supported by the mothers. The mothers are actively in, you know, involved in encouraging their sons to go to Maidan, so to speak, to go to the battlefield. And that has, you know, created what we call an internal support, psychological support from your own mother, creates you and gives you opportunity to, you know, to do something that is very meritorious. How to get the women to change their strategies at home? What, do, what should they do in order for them to become more involved in the creation of the civil association? So what we find is that two of the two institutions why with one another. It's very interesting that we had a webinar from the University of Kufa with Jewish scholars in Pennsylvania and in Montreal from Kufa. And we are talking to the what we call multi-faith communities at different levels. Whereas you know that if we want to get any involvement from North America to come to Najaf, they all are demanding big honorariums. And Najaf doesn't have that kind of money to give them. 
And even the money that comes from IRAX is so limited that you can't attract many, you know, number of Christian and Jewish scholars who work on dialogue. But there are people we know who are working in, in the West Bank, they are working, you know, in, in Gaza on those issues. And therefore, they should be the one to, to be invited in these uh, such projects. My final uh, point that I want to make here is that my field work, working with the religious leaders now, with the youths, and creating the modules, the courses that we would be teaching them, is suggesting to me that the case is not lost. Intercommunal relationships are being imposed from outside. So you better live together. Better live but in a better way to create what we call the citizenship. And that issue, by the way, citizenship, is still you know, in doubt. Or am I, I always say that what, what kind of you know, identity is this one? We want our identity as Muslims or Shia or Sunni, whatever you, but you don't use this secular identity, which is actually the need of the time. Because I worked with the Constitution of Iraq as, as, you know, representing American government. And we had, the big problem that we had in Iraq at that point was, and the Alim has died, Muhammad Baqir, Muhammad Sadiq, uh, al Mahar al -Ulum. He was the one who raised the whole question that, how are we going to accommodate Sharia if we are going to do it within this, within the nation state today? And I simply suggested that I think it touched the, the core, I think, I don't know what happened thereafter. This is a five-year plan. I haven't participated after, after the first five years. But it was clearly noted that the Sharia, when they spoke about the implementation of Sharia, there was always a question of pluralism in Iraq. Whose Sharia are we going to implement? Would it be Shafi? Would it be Hanbali? Would it be Hanafi? Jafari, what exactly would happen? And I think the answer was very clear that this would create even more dissension and more divisions in the Iraqi society. And therefore, there is a need to work on Sharia as a source of value system rather than the source of the juridical corpus that's, that we have inherited you know, throughout the history until modern times. So I think there is one particular line of thought that we are working at at the moment is to train the women and the youth in Iraq on both sides. Because I had the opportunity to lecture in Albania also. And there also there is a reception of the idea that we need to create what we call institutions that would be intercommunal, that would, that would work towards a better society in Iraq. And at the moment, although sometimes it seems so hopeless, but I'm very hopeful that things are working. At least the new paradigm shift is being recognized. Thank you very much.